Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we're going to examine two types of forces, centripetal and centrifugal. We'll discuss what they are, some examples, and why they're important. So let's get started. We'll begin with centripetal forces. These are forces tending to bind together the citizens of a state, thus promoting its unity. I always like to remember this as petals on a flower. The petals are all bound together at the center of the flower. So there's something holding it together. And this can work across different scales. Coronado High School has centripetal forces that hold our school together. Las Vegas has centripetal forces that hold our city together. Nevada has centripetal forces that hold our state together. And the United States has centripetal forces that hold our country together. Centrifugal forces or centrifugal forces, on the other hand, are forces that tend to divide a country threatening the unity of a state. I remember this because years ago, I had asked my students to create a mnemonic device to remember the difference between centripetal and centrifugal forces. They sound very similar, but mean opposite things. So we need to make sure that we don't get them confused. And this one girl raises her hand and said, completely straight faced, Centrifugal forces have the letters F-U in it. And if someone told me F-U, I wouldn't want to be around them anymore. And I kind of just stared at her for a minute and then told her that she was a genius. I don't know that it's the most appropriate way to remember it, but my kids do remember it, so it works. All right, now that we know the definitions, let's look at some examples, shall we? We'll start with a few specific examples. Let's use this as an opportunity to practice our FRQ writing skills. In your notes, make your claim be whether they are centripetal or centrifugal forces. And then explain how or why these examples unify people or threaten unity. Here we go. In Thailand, 94.6% of the population practices Buddhism. So is Buddhism a centripetal or unifying force or a centrifugal or divisive force? In some countries, a state religion can be a unifying force. Buddhism is a unifying force in Thailand as is Hinduism in Nepal, Judaism in Israel, and Islam in Pakistan. Next up, we have Yugoslavia. This country had ethnic, religious, and linguistic differences. So is that diversity more likely to be a centripetal force that unifies the country or a centrifugal force that divides it? In the case of Yugoslavia, when a majority ethnic group controls the state as the Serbs did, minority ethnic groups can be economically, politically, and culturally marginalized, producing strong centrifugal forces. In fact, Yugoslavia broke up and largely fragmented along these ethnic, religious, and linguistic lines, producing several nation states as a result. So forces that unify people are centripetal, and forces that divide them are centrifugal. But many political geographers have argued that this can be too simplistic, and that we cannot simply identify a given event or process and define it as centrifugal or centripetal. So what ultimately determines if something is unifying or divisive? It often depends on one's perspective and may even change over time. For example, the 1989 reunification of Germany was widely perceived as a powerful centripetal force when it happened. However, the challenges of bridging the social divide 
between East and West Germans. And the economic divisions have contributed greater awareness to the centrifugal forces that came from reunification. So now let's look at some of the consequences of centripetal and centrifugal forces. We'll start by looking at what can happen from unifying centripetal forces. The pride in one's ethnicity and cultural background is known as ethno-nationalism. When a group of people have pride in a common ethnicity, religion, or language, it can bring that group of people together. The country of Belarus has a strong ethno-nationalist identity that helps to hold the country together. Russia has threatened Belarusian sovereignty, but the pride that Belarusians have has served as a strong centripetal force for their state. Strong infrastructure can also serve as a social and economic centripetal force. A country that has invested heavily in infrastructure, like airports, interstate highways and railways, have a strong connection. These connections can promote greater interaction between core and peripheral areas, helping to bring those areas together. Communication and energy infrastructure, like the internet and power plants, also helps to maintain connections and ensure a more even distribution of government resources. Many core countries exhibit these centripetal forces, but India also serves as a good example. The well-developed railroad system helps to connect the most remote rural village to its major cities. And even the presence of a large and influential city can be a centripetal force that draws people together. And centripetal forces can bring about greater cultural cohesion. That may seem easy to do in a nation state when ethno-nationalism is strong and everyone shares the same religion or language, but multinational states may promote cultural cohesion through shared icons or symbols. That may be a national anthem or the flag or even a national sports team. South African President Nelson Mandela used the country's national rugby team to bring his country together, unify them, after the end of the centrifugal apartheid system. Centrifugal forces have consequences as well. The first we'll examine is uneven economic development. When a country has poor infrastructure, it's difficult to maintain a strong, cohesive national identity. But neocolonialism also contributes to this as core regions benefit at the expense of peripheral areas. And this can happen at multiple scales, including within a country or within a subnational unit, which can cause tension between those territories. For example, within Brazilian cities, Wealthy citizens have better access to transportation and safer housing options, including communities demarcated by walls and gates to separate the wealthy from the slums. This serves to separate and isolate different groups within a shared space. And this can be especially polarizing in countries that contain a stateless nation. The Kurds are the fourth largest ethnicity in Southwest Asia, yet do not have a state of their own. When combined with the fact that they have been oppressed for their religious and ethnic diversity, it shouldn't be surprising that they are a centrifugal force in the countries within which they reside. The Kurds represent 20% of Turkey's population. But the president of Turkey recently designated a militant Kurdish group as a terrorist organization. These stateless nations, when desiring self-determination, may become a nationalist movement that pushes for independence. The Kurds are already pushing for self-determination and a state of their own, landlocked though it would likely be. 
Czechoslovakia was driven to breaking up through nationalist movements from the Czech and Slovak nations, albeit peacefully. East Timor in the South Pacific was a more violent nationalist movement as they sought independence from Indonesia. After the UN stepped in, East Timor gained their sovereignty in 1999 and is now known as Timor-Leste. And countries like Korea, Vietnam, Germany, and Ireland all saw periods of fragmentation based on centrifugal forces. While centrifugal force may drive an independence movement, there are times when a country can no longer provide the services essential for governing, and then it is considered a failed state. These countries have seen their government lose control, whether through corruption or the loss of trust of its citizens. Conflict like wars, ethnic cleansing, and genocide often contribute to the collapse of a state. In 2019, the UN identified Libya, Syria, Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Yemen, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Colombia, and Vietnam as failed states. And most of these countries had recently or are currently experiencing some type of conflict. And that will conclude our lecture on centripetal and centrifugal forces. We will look at more examples and continue to apply this when I see you back in class. Have a good evening, geographers.